Welcome to uh, Focus on Albany. I'm Cynthia Pooler, and my guest today is John Sullivan, who is a former New York State Democratic chair. So, John, what do you think of the election returns? Well, uh, there's much to think about, Cynthia. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having me on your new Zoom uh, format program. You're getting pretty... Uh, High tech there, Cynthia. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would say that um, the Republicans wanted to launch a hot air balloon, but uh, it failed to lift off. And uh, the Democrats kind of burst their bubble. Uh, you know, we defied the normal trend in an off year, which is that the party of power holding the presidency loses substantial numbers of seats, you know, 20 uh -huh. 30 seats. And um, I was just looking it up and it said, there are 21 congressional seats that are still in dispute. So that's enough to have the Democrats maintain a majority in the House or lose very, very narrowly. Uh -huh. And the House is such that uh, if you've got a two or three vote uh, margin, that can all change in a month or two. Somebody dies, somebody retires, mm -hmm. somebody leaves. It's, you know, that's a very tenuous majority. So we'll wait and see. I think in New York, there's one uh, congressional race, which happens to be in my home district, 22nd. Well, it's not my home district, but part of Oswego County it used to be. They put us the part of Oswego County I'm in, in a North Country district now, which will be represented by Claudia Tenney. <clears throat> but uh, in, in the 22nd Congressional District, which is Syracuse and um, oh, sorry. Syracuse and part of Oswego County, um, the two competitors are Francis Canole, who is the Democrat, and Give his name in a minute here. Um, huh. Brandon Williams. Mm -hmm. And they are they are 50.8 to 49.2. Wow. Very close. And both uh -huh. both camps have, I guess, filed in the Supreme Court for a recount. I think the law is if you are within a half a percent there's an automatic recount. So it looks like that race is heading for a recount. But uh, overall, New York lost four Democratic seats to the Republicans. So uh -huh. New York is, is the lost leader as far as the National Democratic Party is concerned, including uh, Sean pa Patrick uh, Maloney's Maloney. seat. And he was chair of the uh, uh, DCCC. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I, I have some ideas about how that came about. We can talk about that if you'd like. I'd like that. Okay. Well, <clears throat> gerrymandering is just that. Gerrymandering is gerrymandering. It's always been with us. There have been attempts, good government attempts to have commissions, draw the lines and so forth. But really, the um, in New York, as much as we supposedly tried to have a commission draw the lines, the legislature did not like the commission's lines, so they overruled the commission, drew their own lines. They might have gotten a little greedy, maybe it was a little too much. So what did the Republicans do? They filed suit. Where? In Bath, New York, Steuben County pretty Republican county. And the acting Supreme Court Judge McAllister is a Republican, not that necessarily would have made a difference. But he ordered um, a special master to draw the lines. Somebody from, I think he's from, I don't know, Pennsylvania or somewhere. Service was the guy's name. So they redrew the lines and that uh, was not generally favorable to the Democrats. There was a bit of a tweaking 
I think by the judge, there was a hearing, a statewide hearing held in Bath, New York, on the validity of the proposed uh, district lines. Well, that, that's just, uh, I don't know, something wrong with that. In any event, it went to the courts, it got to the highest court in the state, Judge Janet DeFiori wrote the opinion affirming the Steuben County judge and leaving the lines drawn by the master as they were drawn, which were somewhat unfavorable or less favorable, let's say, to the Democrats. In Sean Patrick Maloney's case, that was the case in the 22nd Congressional District. That was the case. Uh, not sure about Long Island, but now there's a lot of speculation about Judge De Fiore because she wrote the opinion and she resigned shortly after that. And there was some kind of connection with uh, former Governor Andrew Cuomo. I think he had her before she was judge representing him uh, or at least helping him out in terms of his response to the various women who were accusing him of misconduct. And she resigned because apparently she got involved in some uh, disciplinary matter by a lower court employee, which was totally inappropriate. So one wonders, I mean, Andrew Cuomo, having left as governor, uh, still is a political player. To what extent were, were his tentacles in this thing, I don't know, but it it's awfully, um, uh, how should I put it? One could assume there was a connection between De Fiore and Cuomo, and since he's no longer governor, governor you know, uh, why should he fight the fight for the legislature? That's mere speculation at this point. But anyway, the lines were drawn in a way that wasn't completely favorable. They lost four seats. They may, um, may gain the one in central New York that was held by a Republican. But all in all, um, it, I guess the, the conclusion is it could have been far worse. Mm -hmm. So if it also the, could have, it also could have been much better. Right. So if the house, um, goes into a Republican majority, do you think New York could be blamed for that? Uh, I think they're already blaming New York. I mean, okay. New York certainly, one would think a blue state like New York would hold its own. California mm -hmm. seems to be holding its own, although there are a lot of uh, three or four races there that are not yet uh, uh, concluded. But New York which would ordinarily be very blue, wasn't as blue as it might have been. Now, why? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of money that was spent, dark money that was spent on these ads. I couldn't turn the TV on without seeing Cannoli Williams, Cannoli Williams, in one break between programs. You know, two ads, one for, one against, um, where did all that money come from? It wasn't all the congressional campaign committees. And we come back to Citizens United. I mean, that has been the worst decision in terms of our democracy and letting all kinds of dark money into the process that we've ever had. We really need to legislate against Citizens United and we need to control the amount of money being spent, particularly by these outside groups. And the amount of money spent this year, I think is a record, if I'm not mistaken, Cynthia, I think it was like $16 billion. With a B? A B, yeah. Oh my God. I mean, that's crazy. And so uh, we can blame Citizens United for that. We can blame New York for being clever by two half, or by one half in its drawing of lines. But when we come to blaming President Biden or former President Trump, it's probably an equal deal. There are about, I, I, I read 
28% of uh, the Republicans in one of the states said they voted, voted against Trump. They weren't voting for someone, they were voting against him. Now, what's really gonna be interesting, if he announces for president, as he's rumored to do, mm -hmm. um, I think that'll throw the Georgia race wide open. I think the Democrats are in a good position to win the Georgia race. Mm -hmm. And they may not need to win it, depending on what happens in Nevada. We mm -hmm. can talk about Nevada too, but uh, that would that would put uh, put us in a position that if, if we win Nevada, then it's fifty fifty in the, in the uh, I believe it's fifty fifty, and then the vice president can break a tie. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get Georgia, it's fifty one forty nine, mm -hmm. and by Trump announcing and coming again to the forefront, one could argue that that is not advantaging the Republican candidate, uh, Warner, that was his name, the football player. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're going to be in good shape as far as the Senate goes. And I think Chuck Schumer is going to be named the new uh, continuous majority leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, who knows if they if they actually they've got a slight advantage as far as winning the majority, but McCarthy is not guaranteed to become speaker. There, there's a faction of uh, real right wing hmm. Republicans who are going to either exact concessions from him or who knows, they may put up their own candidates. So I had heard a few uh, a, a while back that. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene might might throw her, her hat in the ring for the uh, uh, speaker. What do you think? Can you imagine her as speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Third in line to the presidency? Mm -hmm. Our politics has been certainly strained. I, I, when I taught, I used to, uh, first class, I would put the group Diamond Reel up on the screen and their song, uh, uh, what is it? Um, you start walking your way and I start walking mine. Mm -hmm. We meet in the middle, meet that old Georgia pine. Mm -hmm. The kids would be looking at me like, what? why is this country song playing in a political science class? And I would say, I'll tell you why, because that's politics, the art of compromise, mm -hmm. the ability to meet in the middle. If you lose the ability to meet in the middle, the system doesn't work, as we've seen mm -hmm. uh, with the more recent uh, machinations in Washington. So I, I, there are a whole host of reasons for it. We've been building up to this. But, uh, you know, I, I try to tell anyone who listen to me, my Facebook friends at least, think of yourself as a fourth grader. You know, base your vote on the principles that you were taught America stands for in your civics lesson in, in the fourth grade. All of this enmity, all of this... Uh, back and forth is not conducive to compromise, which we need. It's, it's deleterious to our democratic system. And in the case of uh, Trump, you know, it's, it's, it's worrisome because it's autocratic. You know, he doesn't, they don't wanna vote. They wanna control. And uh, that's really scary. But I think we, we dodged a big bullet in this election. Um, how long we will dodge it for is anyone's guess. So were you happy with the uh, gubernatorial results? Uh, <clears throat> was I happy? I was happy that Kathy Hochul won. Am I happy that we have an upstate governor? Mm -hmm. For the first time in 50 years or more, Am I happy that um, am I happy that we have a woman who broke finally shattered the glass ceiling? Yes. Do I think she's well qualified? 
Yes, I know her. I know her to be very, very knowledgeable about upstate New York, particularly, and the city. And, uh, and I think she's measured. She's more mainstream, if you will. I think she'll be a very, very good governor. So I'm happy about that. I'm not happy that she didn't win as big as she might have. But again, you couldn't turn the TV on without Zeldin talking about crime and seeing people being beat up in these commercials. And you know the negativity level was very high. Um, now crime, crime is an issue. I mean, it's an issue particularly in New York City. Not so much upstate, but when you play upon people's fears, as these dark money advertisers did, it moves the needle, obviously. It moved the needle in uh, Governor Hochul's case, maybe four or five points. That four or five points was enough to, <clears throat> excuse me, lose four congressional seats for the uh -huh. Democrats. Oh, I forgot to mention this. One state Senate seat, which is where I live, that is in contention uh, between John Mannion and uh, Rebecca Shiroff. I think they're about 450 votes apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, there's going to be a recall. Uh, a re oh, wow. No, you know, not a recall. Mm -hmm. There will be a recount in that race. And the incumbent, uh, John Mannion, is behind by 400 votes. So we'll see. So uh, do you think do you think Kathy Hochul waged a stellar campaign or less than stellar campaign? I would say stellar. You I mean, would. Pushed, yeah. I think she pushed as many buttons as she could push. Um, she might have dealt with the crime issue a little differently, dealt with it a little more head on. But uh, she was all over the place. She's a good campaigner. You know, when you meet her, she's very personable, very knowledgeable. Um, yeah, I don't know that she could have done any, anything really different. The climate was set not by her, mm -hmm. but by the, the dark money and by the um, national uh, unpopularity of, of the president, which didn't help. But by and large, I mean, as I said, their balloon didn't lift off. Mm -hmm. Balloon didn't completely burst. Mm -hmm. So that's not a bad thing. So do you think if there was a, a candidate other than Zeldin that the uh, that the Republicans could have uh, won the race? You know, uh, that's possible because Zeldin had negatives about birth control, about uh, taxes, and he was what, one of these uh, election deniers. Mm -hmm. He was pretty far out there. Mm -hmm. Had the Republicans nominated more of a mainstream guy, maybe like Molinero, who ran the last time. I mean, he won his congressional race this time. They might have come within inches of Hochul. I still think that the Democratic uh, majority in New York would have held, but only narrowly. And, and maybe not, because look how George Pataki <clears throat> was elected after Mario Cuomo tried to run for a fourth time. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, Governor, come on, four times? You know, what more can you do that you didn't do in the first three terms in a fourth? And people, you know, the pendulum tends to swing. And Pataki was a reasonable candidate. And Cuomo lost very, very badly in upstate New York. And New York City's vote didn't come out. So, so do, you, do you think that if... Andrew Cuomo didn't get himself into hot water and he ran for a fourth term 
then he would be. Oh, he wouldn't be running for. Uh, he would have been running for a third term, like his father. No, fourth term. Fourth. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I don't know why I'm thinking third. Are you sure? Yep. Oh, yes, uh, uh, Mario he, Cuomo lost his fourth term. Mario, Mario did, yes. And, Andrew, and, and had Andrew stayed in it, this would have been his fourth term if he had okay, more than okay, one. I was thinking three, but I'll, uh, I'll defer to your senior wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. That's another thing I just tell my students. That uh, Kenny Rogers mm -hmm. is a brilliant political strategist. You got to know when to hold him. You got to know when to fold him. You got to know when to walk away. And you got to know when to run. I mean, that apply that to politics. And what happens too often is incumbent office holders don't know when to get off the stage. You know, it's not mm -hmm. a lifetime thing. You got to got to know when to when to push and when to shove, when to run and when not to run. And uh, it's, it's human nature to make those kinds of judgments. My, my feeling is I think term limits would help because the longer somebody is in a particular office, the more, they, the more corrupt opportunities present themselves. Mm -hmm. And they get thinking, well, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. What about me? What's, what's in it for me? That's a normal human thing. So I, I think, you know, 12 years is plenty. Eight years should be enough. I support an amendment limiting terms to eight years. When uh, I was just a young buck back in the day, I became, I was chairman of the Oswego City Charter Revision Commission. And we wanted to strengthen the mayor. So we made it, instead of two years, we made it four. But we limited to two terms. Mm -hmm. That still stands. And I believe in that. So were you surprised John Patrick Maloney lost? Uh, no. You weren't. No. I mean, his focus basically was elsewhere. Uh, Sean is a great guy. I like Sean personally. I think he did a really good job of stemming the tide, uh, the rising red tide or whatever they want to call it. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a monsoon, or not a monsoon, a tidal wave. So he his efforts went into everything but his own race and, and he lost. But that was also, was again, part of this redistricting business in New York. Now, I would expect he'll stay involved uh, I would think the Biden administration could use the talents of a Sean Patrick Maloney. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see what happens. But uh, he did a great job, except for himself. Wow. So um, what about Jay, Jay Jacobs? Do you think he's going to stay on as chairman? Uh, if the governor continues to support him, yes, he will. There are those who are critical of him. I don't think he could have done much of anything different that would have uh, affected the outcome. Again, the oodles and oodles and oodles of dark money that poured in, he couldn't have stopped that. He couldn't have stopped the way the lines were drawn. Uh, Jay is a smart, uh, effective chairman. I've known him for many years and the governor supporting him and in New York, if you don't have the governor's support, you're not going to be chairman. If you do, and we have a governor, you're chairman. When I was chairman, we didn't have a governor. Zaki was governor. We had a speaker okay. of the assembly, uh, who, Sheldon Silver, who called the shots. I remember, I'll tell you a story. He called, uh, called me on a Sunday. I answered the phone. It's John, Sheldon Silver here. Oh, Mr. Speaker, hello. How are you? I'm thinking, what the heck is he calling me up on a Sunday for? He said, John, we'd like you to come to Albany and we'd like you to consider being the state chair. I was like, what? <laughs> I had been mayor. I'd, stepped, I'd not run for re-election. 
for a year or two, I think. So I was in private practice. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's a great opportunity. I mean, I'd been a county chair. So I said, well, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. He said, can you come down and talk about it? I said, yes, sir, I will. So um, thank you, hung up the phone. My wife said, who was that? I said, oh, it's just the Speaker of the, of the State Assembly. She said, what did he want? I said, he wants me to be state chairman. She said, really? How much does it pay? <laughs> I, oh, said, I said, I didn't ask him. She said, call him back. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> because I, I, eventually I, I agreed to a sharing arrangement with Judith Hope, mm -hmm. in part because I needed to continue practicing law. I had two kids in college at the time, and I couldn't have lived even on a full-time salary that they were paying at the time. So Judith uh, was able to do all the, she was the fundraiser. She, uh, she was very adept. Basically, they gave me kind of uh, upstate New York as a, here's your territory. So I did. I traveled in all 62 counties. Chuck Schumer, every time I see him. He lost the Democratic Rural Conference, which is something we started in Ithaca that year. He vowed then to be in every county in New York, every election. He has kept that vow. Every mm -hmm. time I see him, I go, 62 counties. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what are your predictions for the, for the future? What do you think is going politically? Think, what do you think is going to happen? I think Cynthia Pooler is going to spread her wings like wildfire and become a major spokesperson for New York's political scene. Now that you are on TV with your gracious presence. Thank you. And so other than me, what do you think uh, <laughs> the future holds? I'm an optimist. I've always been an optimist. I think that the new generation, I think we need, we need younger people to uh, get involved. I actually, uh, for president this year, I supported uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. uh, I think someone like Buttigieg, I mean, he's, he's eloquent, he's smart, he's very well versed on subject matter, he's a veteran, he's gay, okay? If people can not disallow him for that reason, he's certainly well qualified and he is of the next generation. You know, President Biden's going to be 80 pretty soon. I'm 75. I know I don't look it. <laughs> um, but I, I think we need to bring in Gen X and Z or whatever they are. Kids need to run for office at the local level, the state level. We need, we need some fresh blood and fresh new ideas. And so I'm hopeful that all of the negativity that exists now can at least be tampered down to a degree to allow those who are interested in public service, public service, running for public office, people should do that not to aggrandize their ego, like the governor of Florida, for example, or our former president, they should do so because they can make a difference in people's lives. They can make the world a better place, make their city a better place. That's why I ran for office every mm -hmm. time. And I think I succeeded to some extent. Mm -hmm. I think we made Oswego a better place. I, I would argue that we made New York State when I was co-chairman a little bit better place for the Democrats with the my, my biggest signature accomplishment was the Democratic Rural Conference, you know, uh, and I'm proud of that. So the future is bright. Uh, I'm back to my famous quote from Thomas Jefferson. A people who believe they can be both free and, and ignorant, believe that which never has been and never can be. A democracy presupposes an informed electorate. So we need to have an informed electorate. So I do have another question for you. 
Do you think Biden's going to run for a second term? No. You don't? No. Who's waiting in the wings? Good question. Kamala Harris, the vice president, certainly. Uh, a couple governors. Um, Pete Buttigieg. Maybe someone we don't even know. Somebody who's... Uh, I, I certainly hope Elon Musk stays out of things. He's uh -huh. in enough trouble as it is. <clears throat> I, uh, I I think there'll be new new blood. I just don't. I mean, I don't know President Biden personally. He was in Syracuse Law a couple of years ahead of me. I know I know his wife's his first wife's family, the Hunters from Auburn, and I like I like Joe Biden. I mean, I think he's. He's done a very, very remarkable job of getting things in gear and moving things forward. He's not getting much credit for it for a whole host of reasons, the war in Ukraine and the, the uh, uh, epidemic that we've had. But by and large, you know, he's, he's doing okay. And, uh, but every time you see him go up and down the plane, he does, he looks as if he's ready to retire. Mm -hmm. And I think he probably is. Mm -hmm. I bet his wife wants him to. Um, so we'll see. I mean, uh, right now he's gonna, not going to not going to say what he's going to do until probably after the first of the year. Okay. So, John, I'm sure we'll have many other conversations over the next couple of years uh, about the state of the Democratic Party. <laughs> so you have been listening to John Sullivan who was the state Democratic chairman at, at back in the, what, 80s, 90s? Uh, 90, uh, 91 to 95, 95, I think. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Focus on Albany. And if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day. Thank you, Cynthia. Always a pleasure.